Hi, this is Alan Gassman. Thank you so much for spending your Saturday with us. I am here with a very, very amazing person, Gerald Scarf, and another amazing person, Jim Hartley. And we are so glad to have everybody here today. Just a, a brief mention that if you came in through the cpaacademy.org, you're gonna get your one hour of credit. We're gonna have four polling questions. If you came in through our website, no CPE credit, sorry about that. If you have questions for Gerald, go ahead and click on the upside down pyramid. I don't know why it's upside down, but it is. Type in your question and then we'll let Gerald know what your question is. We'll have limited time for questions, but we'll be able to answer some of them. So Jim Hartley, who is probably the number one rock and roll art expert in the world has introduced me here to Gerald. And Jim, do you wanna give just a little bit of background on Gerald and a little bit of background on your amazing organization? Oh, well, I'd love to. Um, it, it, it was pretty amazing to me that we had years of doing what we did. And all this time I had wondered from time to time, where that artwork was. And we have been working in a number of areas and done things that amazed myself. I couldn't believe that we were fortunate enough to get involved in the areas we did. And, and then what so often happens in life, somewhat by chance, um, I, I managed to find a way to speak with Gerald and with some people who were representing him at the time and it it blew my mind if I can use the vernacular that uh, his art, his vintage art that he's so famous for, and so many people, millions around the world are aware of and covet, uh, hadn't been available. And so I was managed to be introduced, and uh, that led to us uh, in 2017 doing the first ever exhibition of. Uh, the, the most important of his work, his vintage work, and we held an exhibition in San Francisco and the got world press, got world attention, uh, world record prices, um, well deserved, um, and that led to everything since. I mean, we've uh, worked very closely. Gerald is such a brilliant mind and able to transfer that through his arms and fingers onto uh, the painting surface uh, to be able to express things that uh, aren't always conscious, you know, to the person re looking at it, but they, they feel it instantly no matter what. Um, so it, it's been a great honor, a great privilege, and I have uh, uh, thanks to the universe above for bringing us together at one point. And uh, we've, we've now, uh, Gerald's asked us, and we've been looking to place his entire collection is actually available for purchase now. And we're working with a number of people in that area. Uh, he's also one, if anyone has the interest that can do amazing commissioned work as well. And so all of that's available. Uh, I'm delighted that he agreed to come on today and share his life with us. Um, it's one well worth hearing. Uh, my gallery, I guess I could say a few words, is that we are generally known as the top viewers worldwide for the original art of rock and roll. Deal with some 200 artists uh, across the board. Um, but the genius we're talking to today is singular. Beautiful. So, Gerald, people who are attending this presentation, I think. I think we all understand that you're one of the top artists, one of the top cartoonists, one of the top animators in the in the history of art. How did this all start? And can you tell us just a little bit about your childhood and what your very first art experiences were and maybe when you got a seed in your mind that said, "Wow, I could I could be an artist and really reach out to the pe to people?" Sure, yeah. 
Well, I was born in London in 1936, which was before the war. And I was, when, as soon as I was born, they discovered that I was asthmatic. I had terrible asthma. And the drugs in those days were not that sophisticated. So I suffered quite a lot as a small child. But, you know, as with all of these things, I kind of was able to get along with it. I had my own life. My parents, my father was in the Royal Air Force uh, and my mother for the war uh, was a teacher. And um, they, I guess, were very scared for me. They were scared anyway. We all were during the war. And I have memories at a very young age when Hitler was flattening uh, London with his bombs of going down into the cellar of the house where we Hampstead in London and hiding there. And strangely enough, someone told me that there was a wolf down there. And I was a six-year-old, and uh, I was far more scared of the wolf than I was of Hitler and his Luftwaffe. And, uh, but, uh, you know, that, that's being a child, I guess. Uh, after the war, I, you know, I had very, very, well, throughout the whole of my childhood, I had very, very bad schooling because I was continually asthmatic. If I went to school, I would be there for a week or maybe 10 days and another attack would come and I'd be out of school for two weeks. And nearly all of my reports at that time say Gerald tries very hard. He, he works hard, but unfortunately, and there was always that word, unfortunately, his illness keeps him from school. So I would say that I'm ill-educated in that way. But um, the one thing I could draw do was draw. And I think drawing at even at that early time became my way of expressing myself, putting myself onto paper and, and uh, explaining the world to myself, really, my fears, in fact. And um, I continued to do that right the way up until I guess I left school at about 16, which is the, you know, the usual age when people go on to further education and go on to university or something like that. But my father, who was in banking, thought that being an artist was uh, an insecure job. He's absolutely right. He's, it is an insecure job. Um, I've been lucky, as, as it turns out, over the years. But there are many artists, like there are other people in the arts, waiting on tables in McDonald's or wherever, you know. And, however, my father, you know, although it was evident to everybody else that I should have been put into an art school, an art, the art world, he thought he would try and get me into a bank. And I did various bank interviews and I failed them all, absolutely failed them all because, you know, I think I wanted to fail them all because I knew that being into banking for me was like the other end of the spectrum to where I wanted to be. And, uh, so eventually I began to uh, draw cartoons, which I'd been drawing all the time, and send them to various magazines. In the meantime, I was working in an uncle's studio. He had a commercial art studio. And this is really before the days of photography was sophisticated enough and everything was drawn. Anything you wanted to sell, I had to draw. Could it, be a, it could be, you know, cups and saucers, chairs, tables, or whatever you wanted to sell. And the trouble with it was that I had to tell lies. I had to make everything I saw glossy, beautiful, have highlights and fantastic, look fantastic. And this, after a while, it began to worry me. You know, I'm just a liar. Here I am prostituting my art, you know, when I, I should be telling the truth about the world. If anything, I've been given this terrible, this uh, tremendous kind of talent, if, if anything, and I'm not doing it. So it was then I began to try and find a way out of that morass that, you know, was commercial advertising. The one thing it did teach me how to do in, in the commercial art studio was to draw properly, if you know what I mean, realistically. I could draw a saucepan or I could draw a bicycle, or I could draw anything that you could buy, a car, shoes, whatever. But it was tedious, tedious job. And I got out of it by going into cartooning and it kind of opened up from there. I, I sent drawings to Punch magazine in London at the time, and they accepted them. Uh, mm -hmm. And I was, you know, paid, I guess, about a dollar a week in my uncle's place. Not, he, not that he was mean, but, I, you know, 
I wasn't considered a good risk. But then, you know, when I was um, doing a cartoon, I'd get about, you know, $10 a cartoon. So it was a huge leap. And I could do 50 of them, or five of them a week, come in and make $50 and so on. So I thought, this is the this is the life. This is not what I'm, you know, I'm not sitting there doing saucepans and bicycles and things like that. Uh, anyway, Alan, stop me if you want to, because I'm oh, rolling on here. No, this is very good. <laughs> Keep going. Uh, and uh, well, it, it kind of developed, and I was able to develop it from there into doing um, cartoons. And eventually, um, there was a satirical magazine in London called Private Eye, which hit the hit the newsstands and everything around about mid early mid sixties. And and it was really uh, shocked people because it said things in this magazine that weren't normally said. Um, and um, I became the artist of that, one of the artists of that magazine. And it was in there that I really kind of hit the public eye. And I, suddenly I was transformed from this asthmatic child who'd been doing joke cartoons, really, gag cartoons, into I found that I could use my art to describe the world around me, the domestic and the political world in particular. And I began to draw politicians and so forth. And, and then it all kind of opened up. I can't tell you, I was suddenly renowned or was all known. And TV wanted to interview me. I had articles written about me. I, I was on, you know, it, it was, it just changed overnight. And um, from then on, I was able to sort of, call, and to a certain extent, name my own ticket. You know, I had galleries, gallery shows, I had, um, TV, I had my own TV show. I had um, oh, it was endless. And I, I I was taken into the theatre. I began to do costumes and design there. Um, eventually, I got to know the Pink Floyd, and I worked with them on the wall. And then I, um, well, I, I was a huge, huge Disney fan as a child. And then so one day they just wrote to me from Disney and said. Uh, how would you like to be a production designer on Hercules, which I became. Um, that, strangely enough, became about because the boy, the man who was the director of Hercules, when he was growing up in Chicago, he was kind enough to say he was a fan of my work. He collected my work. And um, he remembered me all those years and he had a big hit with a little mermaid and suddenly he could call his own ticket and that's when he called me in and uh, said would you like to uh, you know, be involved in Hercules and I said would I yeah um, but people found it strange at the time that me with my bitter grotesque satirical work should be allied with Disney who as we all know is renowned for being cutesy and uh, anyway uh, it, I did it. I enjoyed it. So the, I've had a very, very checkered career. I mean, I, when I first um, went to um, join national newspapers from the satirical magazine, um, uh, they sent me to Vietnam for 19, in the 1960s. I was in Vietnam doing reportage there. They sent me to the Six Day War in the Middle East. Uh, they sent me to to Northern Ireland do it with all the troubles there and um where i was hijacked by the ira one one day and uh, i can tell you about that if you want to know and uh, so i've had a very um checkered career starting from that very unpromising beginning and i mean i to say how did i do it well it, the high, it's really hard work of course but i had the luck to have a talent although I say it myself and other people have told me that, you know, I have a talent to be able to transfer the ideas in my head down my arm onto the paper. But you've got to have those ideas to start with anyway. You've got to have that. And my attitude of the mind, uh, my attitude of mind has always been uh, questioning and satirical, I suppose, sort of cynical, cynical is another word. And, um, but then, you know, I've been able to turn that cynicism to directing, um, Tchaikovsky's Nutcracker. I did the uh, Ch Nutcracker. I did the costumes and decor for that. So you know, I've been able to spread even the cynicism into a kinder area. 
so so Gerald, going back to that childhood, was yep. there someone in particular who really encouraged you or set an example or said, yeah, you can do this or or that came from within? I think it originally, obviously, all the people around me um, said, you're a cool artist, you're, you know, you're a good artist and so forth, but they didn't know how to apply it. There was no one in my family or immediate family that knew about being an artist. And, uh, oh, here's my tea, thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, and um, so I wasn't, I couldn't say I was encouraged by my family. Uh, at schools, so I was encouraged, and there was, in fact, an, one teacher when I became to the age of 15. Uh, the head teacher of this particular school that I was attending, although irregularly attending, as I explained, um, he said, "You know, you are never going to be an academic. You don't have the back. You don't have the, you know, because every time I was away from school." Uh, for say two or three weeks, I go back and they'd started algebra. And I went, what the hell is this algebra? You know, a, a squared equals one. You know, I, I just, it was like a foreign language I was trying to pick up over and over and over again. So I struggled, I struggled. And um, this head teacher said to me, Listen, you know, you're not going to make it as an academic. Why don't you, why don't we all admit you are going to be an artist? And let's send you to art school. And he said, the only trouble is that in this, uh, in Britain, you can't be, can't go to further education until you're 16, which is the regulatory time. But I'm going to spend, send you to this place where you can, uh, although you're only 15, they'll hopefully they'll accept you. So I went along with my father for this interview at the school, and I can remember it because so well because the guy said, oh yeah, so that's interesting. Well, right now. Let's have a look at your work. And I hadn't taken any work with me because no, my father had no experience of this. My, I had no experience. So I said, oh, well, I haven't got any with me. And, the, and the, the head of this school said, well, surely, you know, you're coming here for, I've, I've, we've got to see your work. And I said, well, I'm sorry, I didn't understand that. And um, naively. And um, he said to me as I left, he said, well, listen, I, I'm afraid I think you are a bit young to be coming here. Um, and, um, you know, but th remember this, he said, Ev any anywhere you go from now on, take a portfolio of your work. Otherwise, how are people going to judge you? So that was kind of like a fork in the road that I missed. If I'd gone to art school at the age of 15, this may have been a bit diff different story. And, you know, I've told this story to other people and they say, well, you, you know, but you may not become the person you've become because, you know, the route you've taken has produced you as you are. If you'd gone to art school, you might have been a totally different beast, uh, which is true. Of course, we never, none of us know how we're going to end up. You're affected by various things that push you this, that and that way uh, throughout your life. And... Um, so, to, short answer to your question, no, I wasn't particularly in, in, uh, encouraged, and my father, as I said, had no knowledge. And my mother, although she was probably the dominant person in the family, didn't, um, you know, seem to have an op opinion on it looking back. You know, I, she kind of let me go wherever. Um, and so it wasn't until I finally began to produce cartoons in punch or private eye that people said to me wow you've got a different attitude to life and your work looks different you know there must have been something about me and of course it may be because I was not brought up through the regular channels of art school and so forth I, I think we're all lucky that you didn't I think we're all lucky that you didn't get into that that you didn't bring your portfolio with you that's so right we're going to launch the first polling question here for you certified public accountants. And here it is. Gerald's first job illustrating cartoons and designing covers was for, and I'm going to tell you the answer, it's D, Punch. And he also worked for the private eye. He had nothing to do with Benjamin Franklin's Farmer's Almanac. Benjamin Franklin was for Gerald. And I don't know if he had anything to do with the Daily Mail, Gerald. Did you? I did have to do with the Daily Mail, yes. In fact, when I was uh, receiving my success at Private Eye, the satirical magazine, 
suddenly the national press, which is the Daily Mail in Britain, and at the same time there was another huge daily circular called the Daily Express, suddenly they both began to vie for me, for my, you know, to join their staff. And once again, I've never had anything like it, but they took me out, wined and dined me and offered me this and offered me that. And I hummed and hard because at that time, being kind of naive, I thought, all I want really is political freedom because both of these newspapers were kind of right wing, I guess. And um, I didn't want to feel that I had to produce cartoons that they would want to be right wing. I wanted to have a free voice, which in general, most cartoonists do have, I have to say, in, in Britain anyway. And they took me out and I remember I went up to the proprietor of the Daily Mail and the editor of the Daily Mail. And they took me to a place called the Caprice in London, which is a very high end. And everybody drank a lot of wine. And eventually the his name was Lord Rothermere, who owned the newspaper. Lord Rothermere said to the editor, what are you offering, Gerald, you know, in the way of a, of a, a salary and a car? And he said, uh, well, we were thinking of giving him um, 5,000 pounds and a Rover car. And uh, the proprietor said, oh, give him an E-Type. Now, an E-Type was a fabulous Jaguar car, you know, sports car. And give him, um, you know, 6,000 pounds a year, which I'm told is like 120,000 pounds a year, which would be, I don't know how many dollars you've been working out um, per year. And, and so I was suddenly offered that, and they offered me this this, this Jaguar E-Type, which was a kind of 60s car that looked like a flying bullet. Uh, and so that was my first, I thought, hey, this is good. This is this is general journalism, you know. They, this is, they give you a car, they give you that. Never happened again after that, mind you. Have no one ever gave me anything thereafter in any newspaper or anywhere. So it was a kind of one-off. But the Daily Mail, unfortunately, um, didn't quite know what to do with me because the satirical, bitter, grotesque, what a w wicked drawings I'd been doing for a, um, a student-type magazine, I could not do in the national press. And suddenly, although they wanted me for my notoriety, they didn't want me for the work that I did. Got a bandwidth issue. Yeah, it's band. There he goes. Do we lose you know, sound? Get him out of the country. I, know, I hope they weren't trying to finish me off. But it oh. yeah. Can you hear me? I'm having sound issues. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, there we are. We're back. I I can you hear us, Jer Jerry? Like, okay. yeah. I'll take over. <laughs> No, I'm I'm here. I just turned off my camera to get a little bit more bandwidth for everybody. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we no. hear you. Absolutely. You can hear me. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So so where was I talking about Vietnam? Yeah. Did you hear that bit? Yeah. Tell us they about didn't know Vietnam. Tell us about Vietnam. Well, the, the you know they sent me to Vietnam because I, they couldn't accept my normal drawings and they wanted you know to uh, to use me in that way. And uh, it was 1966, it was the height of the Vietnam War, and it was an entirely new kind of experience, of course, for me. And it was extremely sad because I discovered, you know, when I got there, that although I'd seen on television these pictures of these gung-ho Marines jumping out of helicopters with the rotor blades fanning the grass and everything, you know, gung-ho John Wayne-ish, um, the actual, you know, the reality of it was extremely sad. Most of the guys there, as we know, in their 19, 20, 21 year old area, they're sort of taken out of their studies in America and flown to the other side of the world and asked to fight the Vietnamese, who they euphemistically called the, the gooks. You know, that was um, 
done was their way of dehumanizing them, I suppose. And these guys were scared out of their wits, most of them, quite rightly. Uh, and I, for instance, the day after I arrived there, I was with this platoon, or the remnants of a platoon, uh, that had been sent out into the jungle to f fight the Viet Cong. And when they were in the jungle, um, they were surrounded by the VC, the Viet Cong, and they didn't know how to, so they radioed the, the airstrike aircraft above them and explained the circle within which they were and told them to come in and strike outside the circle where the Viet Cong were. Uh, as so often happens, it was they got the instructions wrong and they came in and they struck inside the Americans in friendly fire, it's called. They, 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 they blasted most of the American platoon of young kids out to, into eternity. And I was with some of the poor guys who um, survived and they were shocked. You know, there were some, they'd only been there a very short time. And they just made a buddy or something, you know, with some other guy. And that guy would have been blown away. So, you know, it was a terrible situation. Uh, I, I was uh, pretty miserable being there, as you can imagine. Um, ironically, there were parts of Vietnam which were beautiful. There were, you know, there was where the war hadn't reached. Uh, beautiful the, the highlands of Dalat and so forth. But I tried to... Um, to draw everything there that I could, and um, I, I thought I, I thought one of the things I should do is draw in the morgue there. You know, they had a morgue, and um, I went there to this place, which was a you know kind of like tin sheds, and um, the sergeant who took me there he, he, he said to me, "You sure you want to do this?" And I said, "Yeah, yeah, no, I'm an artist. I I, I draw anything. I draw it." You know, so he said, "You sure?" I said, yeah, yeah, of course. So he took me in then into this shed. And um, I was so shocked at that point. I remember I clutched, I started clutching my, my armpits and sweating like hell because there were the remains of bodies in there. You know, they, it, they didn't fall over as I'd always imagined they would like they did in John Wayne movies. They fell over in, you know, they have bodies without heads, bodies with arms, but not legs, just torso, just lumps of meat. And, um, yeah, I, I immediately turned to the sergeant and said, you're right, I can't handle this, you know, and he says, oh, come on, let's get out of here. So it's one of those places that I, you know, there's very few places I haven't been able to draw, but that was one of them. Anyway, I'm sorry to tell you such a grim story. They're not all like that. But, it, you know, war is, war is pretty pretty horrible and, and although we all watch it on tv we watch it with the, you know our tv dinners we got we got kind of have a different mentality we're watching you know eating tv dinner and we're watching um bloody massacres and so, so forth um so um that 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 was where the daily mail sent me and then after a year i left the daily mail because uh, I, I just didn't like it then i just um and i took a car with me i took the e-type with me so um I got that <laughs> out of it. I can't can't hear you, Ellen. Can you hear me? Are you are you able to hear me, Jim? I am <laughs> able to hear. You. Yes, Jim, I can hear. You. Can you hear me? Okay. I wonder. I wonder if I might, to, while Alan gets back online, you talk a little bit about how you originally met Roger Waters and the guys and how that led into the film? Well, uh, the, 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 I think that um, I made a film in Los Angeles, an animated film called Long Drawn Out Trip. And it was an animated film about everything American I could think of at that time, like the Statue of Liberty, Frank Sinatra, Mickey Mouse, Playboy magazine, you know, there was a, it was a stream of consciousness with all of these images melting and moving one into another. I think you can find it online. It's a long drawn out trip. And um, although I didn't know the Pink Floyd, um, uh, what they 
two of the guys in that saw it, Nick uh, Mason and Roger Waters, and they rang, it went out here on the BBC, and the next morning they rang one another and said, did you see that film by Scarf last night? Um, it's fantastic. You know, we, we've got to have him work with us. He's fucking mad, they said, you know. So I was in, in, you know, I was brought into their fold because I'm fucking mad. And that was the way they, they saw it. And uh, the, so at first, you know, I started working on one of their things, Wish You Were Here. I did some stuff for that. And I, I originally, when I began, I couldn't kind of get a handle on it. I didn't know quite what to do. And a lot of my work at that period was sort of surreal work, um, you know, various images, surreal images and so forth. A man walking towards the camera and in a, in a sandstorm and he gradually erodes, that sort of thing, you know, and uh, another man tumbling through the through space and he turns into a a leaf and then back into a man and it's all i haven't any idea what it's all about now but anyway that the time it seemed to fit the bill um and as roger wisely says you know to a certain extent you can put any image with music and the human brain will work out a reason it should be there you know so in other words and any image will kind of work if you put it there that people assume it, it's got to be a reason um, but then eventually Roger came to me and said he'd written this thing called The Wall. And he was very, you know, strong about this piece. And he, he said, when I've written it, I'm going to bring it to your house and play you the tapes. And um, which he did. He came to my house in Chelsea in London and uh, he played me. I was the first person probably to hear these tapes of The Wall. And it's quite difficult listening to other people's work, you know, because you know, you know, at the end of it, you've got to give an apt reply. You've got to say something which is nice about it. Uh, and I found it, I found it at the end of it, because at, at that time it was just raw tapes. It was just Roger singing to a synthesizer. And I hadn't got the musical imagination to understand what it could become and did become. And, um, so it, it was it was an awkward moment really and at the end of it when it all finished there was a bit of a silence and i said something like um oh that's that's great that's you know that's that's, that's terrific I, you know, I did my best to find the, the adjectives and he said you know i've just done that he said, i feel as though i've just taken my pants down and shit in front of you and i don't know what he meant he felt vulnerable you know because he this was works and months months of work and um he just felt you know he'd exposed himself in front of me sort of thing okay are you getting me are you, yeah. are you receiving me yeah you are good <laughs> so that's um you know how he felt about it. and then from then on roger and i worked on the wall he on the music and the lyrics and me on the images. And I had in my house in Chelsea, a whole wall that was devoted to the wall. And I would make little drawings, you know, that were about this kind of size, normal full scrap paper type. And I would pin them onto the wall. And therefore they would, you know, they could be moved around. They was kind of taped onto the wall and you could move one to, so you could create a sequence by moving them around. And I, I'm quite a quick artist, so I could draw things very, very quickly and sketch them in. And um, which I did. And so that's how the thing evolved and came together. And um, eventually we, he, he very cleverly said, um, I'm going to make this a record, an album, and I'm going to make it a show and I'm going to make it a, a movie all of which he achieved he, he made all of those things happen with the wall and or it was a a difficult experience in some ways because alan parker the british director came in and he immediately wanted to take control of it and roger and i had been working on it 
for 18 months or something like that. We weren't about to have it snatched out of our hands. But the, being the director, naturally, he wanted control. I understand his point of view. Yeah. So it was a bit kind of fraught. And I remember people saying at the time, you know, you put three megalomaniacs in a room together. What do you expect? It's bound to be fraught, you know. So, um, and I remember going to Pinewood Studios in London here, in outside London. I'm not a heavy drinker, but I, every morning I would go in at like 8.30 in the morning. And I had a bottle of Jack Daniels on the passenger seat next to me. And before I went in, I had to take a slug because I knew what was coming up. It was going to be heavy stuff, you know. Um, but eventually, you know, when we finally, of course, when we got the whole thing together and we became friends again, and, and the, the uh, animosities that you have in work sometimes, when you look back on them in later life, you think, oh, that's stupid, you know, why would we be so upset about that? So uh, we um, became sort of friends at the end, all of us. I mean, it was just really, I think, Roger and Alan were the, the you know they both were I was kind of in the middle as the artist I didn't have the the, the power of either of those two but the, I was I was trapped in the middle but I was always seen as Roger's man and that was part of the difficulty I always did start side with Roger naturally because he's the one I worked with to produce this uh, thing and at the time we didn't have any kind of feeling as to what it would be, what kind of movie it would be. Uh, and since then, I mean, I'm as shocked as anybody or surprised as anybody to see that it has became, become an iconic classic. And I myself get emails weekly from Pink Floyd fans or people who were growing up at that time who, you know, want to make contact or say something about it and so forth. I had a guy... Uh, he sent me um, a, an email saying, this is about three or four years ago, um, would I mind if he had my images tattooed onto his arm and chest? <laughs> uh, and I said, no, no, I, I don't mind. You know, you screw your body up if you want to. It's not, you know, it's not, that's your choice. No, I wouldn't do it. I said, well, you know, he wanted it. Anyway, he did it. And he sent me a, a VHS. Uh, of this tattoo being done on his arm and the you know the tattooist was there working away mopping the blood away which was running down his arm and this guy addressed me he was an american he said mr scarf i want to thank you for what you've done for me you, you got me through the vietnam war uh no no the, the 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 gulf war you got me through the gulf war and i said how could that be you know how can that with my guy yeah, uh, you did, and um, I, I want to thank you, and I'm going to send you my Gulf War medal, which wow. he did. He sent me his Gulf War medal. Of course, I immediately sent it back. I said, "You're the, you know, you're the hero, not me. I'm just an artist." Uh, and so uh, that's how strongly people feel about the music and the images. And I guess we all have, you know, things in our times in our life where. A certain piece of music seems apt, you know, it's when you meet your first girlfriend, boyfriend or whatever, as you know, it's whoever is the, you know, David Bowie, whoever happens to be around at that time, it becomes an iconic moment for you personally. And I think that, you know, a lot of people find that with a wall. I've had, a, I've had so many people. And as, as Jim said, um, they buy a lot of my work through him and through my, my website and so forth. So it's a not, you know, it's it's a it's a thing which is uh, keeps sustaining itself. It's quite extraordinary. The um, I, I don't know anything you know, like it except well, I suppose Hercules is very much the same in a, being a Disney movie, of course. But uh, this Pink Floyd thing is, and no wonder these rock stars I was thinking go mad. I mean, I've been to their concert. I've been to Rogers' concerts, of course, and. Um, the adulation there of 30,000 people in the audience, no wonder they go slightly crazy, you know. Anyway, on we go. So, Gerald, I'm, I've got a polling question going on here. Obviously, the answer is D, you created artwork for Pink Floyd. Have you done artwork for any other bands? I did some work for Bill Wyman in the Rolling, you know, the Rolling Stone, Bill Wyman, and um, 
I've had a lot of approaches, but you know, there's a hell of a lot of work involved doing something like that movie. I and I guess you know, I certainly couldn't do it now. I work on a movie of that. Um, was there were you know, and also directing, as I was the animators. Uh, it all took a lot of uh, strength in a way, I guess, you know, to to do that. And I wouldn't at the my present age be able to do that. But no, I do get, of course, a lot of people saying, can you do this? But I don't think most people understand how very, very expensive animation is. It's generally animation they want me to do with images and so forth, you know. And uh, it's incredibly expensive because it's um, labor heavy and, and time consuming. Yeah. So, Gerald, I'm, I'm showing some images here from the wall. And yeah. my own experience with the wall was was extraordinary. I was in law school and thinking about what life was about. And when I saw the wall, I knew more about what life was about. Um, so what oh, really? Tell, tell me. What is life about? <laughs> well, there's some good things and some bad things. Yeah. And childhood was extreme. And I could certainly identify with the, the teacher putting me in a meat cleaver and grinding <laughs> it all up. But yeah. one question is, do you think that you had an influence on the music and the lyrics? Because while Roger Waters was working on this as a rough draft, he was talking to you about war and about childhood and, and seeing your, your images. Did you influence the project? Well, marginally, perhaps, but I think he'd written the whole thing, you know, and had the idea for it long before, although it, it changed, of course, as all works of, in progress do. Um, I know, for instance, he wanted something that represented the power of fascism, so we say, the power of, you know, and I thought, of, you know, what is the most unwielding, unforgiving kind of implement I could think of? And I came up with a hammer. And the hammer, you know, then I made, I made the hammer's march in a kind of Gestapo type way. So it had that her, her, you know, overpowering horror. And then Roger then wrote hammer, hammer, hammer into the lyrics. I mean, it's a very it's a small example of the way it's a two way traffic. But in general, of course, the whole thing is him and it's his story. Although it's his, but then having said that, although it's his story, it's seen through my eyes, and therefore it's my story as well. And uh, you know, when he tells me that he had a rough time at school, I, I, I hardly went to school, as I told you. But um, w when I was there, of course, a lot of the teachers were bullying and they were frightening and so forth. So. Um, you know, I, I think it worked two ways, but it wasn't until I've given a lot of interviews over the wall uh, uh, that I've come to realize myself that the images are mine. They're my imaginations of his his mind. He never, ever told me this should look like this or look like that. He's very, very good, Roger, at, at understanding that when you hire an artist to do something you're hiring that artist for what he does not for what you want to try and bend him into so i never really ever had any interference only i had encouragement so it was a very happy kind of relationship um although roger has a a, a name for being very direct um i don't remember we had any arguments about it at all it was it was a very kind of happy unusually happy relationship in that way they did call us the odd couple because we you know we kind of didn't i came from one world he came from another he was a rock star and i wasn't and um but um although roger later told me i was a rock star because you know the old he took me into the auditorium one day when one of the sequences was playing and I saw that the audience rose to their feet and, and cheered when my work came on, which is an astounding, astounding experience for an artist. An artist usually is a solitary person who works alone in the solitary you know, gallery of their, or their studio. And um, to get that kind of 
roar of applause from 30,000 people, or whatever it happens to be, is something else I can tell you. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. So uh, let's let's get another polling question out of the way, if you don't mind. Not at all. Uh, and what, I, what I'd like you to tell us during this polling question, and the answer is D, is what was it like creating with, with Roger Waters and Pink Floyd and then going and creating with the Disney uh, organization? What was their culture like? How was that different? Oh, totally different, I suppose. Oh, no, you know, the, first of all, the rock and roll world I was in was, you know, the usual stuff, you know, um, you know what you would expect limos helicopters and all that sort of thing and a certain amount of drugs going down and it was all that but because when you get to disney it's the cleanest part of the world you can imagine and even disney studios in burbank is sparklingly clean and the floor is swept i think nearly every hour it feels like you never see a coffee coffee cup lying around but as i said earlier disney to me was a kind of a god because when I was growing up as a child and didn't know what to do, I recognized through Disney, there was something that I really, really responded to. And I think that my favorite film still is Pinocchio, a beautifully drawn animated film. And I did learn to understand and admire the artists who do these, the animators who do this, because they take still drawings and they put them one after the other and they're able to show not only movement, but also emotion. They can show unrequited love, anger, you know, terror, all through a select, a, a series of drawings. It's quite amazing uh, what they can do. I really got to, to, to admire them. Uh, um, when I first went there, I felt a bit kind of shy because, you know, the directors had asked me to set the style for Hercules and they told the animators that but i kind of felt well who am i to go and tell these guys how to draw because they all most of them are pretty good drawers anyway and um but you know they they said to me you well, don't worry no we're used to being told what to do we're used to being told what to draw and we eventually got a you know i i, I relaxed and was able to then show them my designs which was a bit scary you know when they when they but they were all very well received and then thereafter when they were actually animating i would go around their desks like a teacher and say you know those ears are too big or these arms are too long or something like that you know and try and put keep the thing on course with my uh, style and so forth uh, are you still getting me bill uh, alan absolutely yeah. Absolutely. Well, you're looking. You're looking like you're. You're looking worried. Anyway, maybe maybe that's what you do. I don't know. Uh, uh, yeah. So uh, it was a really um, a, a wonderful experience, and um, they treated me like a kind of grand old man, which I guess I was. Or I certainly am. Well, I'm an old man, and um, they, they, there was a. Um, you know, a, a wonderful feeling about the whole thing all the way through and right the way through to the end. And um, um, I think the best characters for me, of course, as you would imagine with my style, were the wicked ones. Uh, I was always more interested in the wicked ones like Hades, who was the god of the underworld, you know. And I immediately thought with him, he's a wonderful character because he's the god, he's the god of hell, you know. And... Um, I thought of a way of um, making me express this hell by having fire about his body, about his personality. Even when he was calmish, or he had this sardonic, this little blue flame flickering like a gas flame flickering around his body. But when he erupted into anger, he burst with flame. Poof! So he, I was able to use the flame as a kind of expressive you know, thing for his persona and for his, um, how he felt at that moment. But um, where I didn't get on so well, I guess, was with the kind of, um, the female characters that I had and needed a lot of help to do, to get the, to get Meg, who was the, the, the main female character. She was kind of um, feisty and so forth and turned out really well, I, but I, I, um, the comic characters and the evil characters, 
I was better at than I was at the, you know, the, the, the love interest or whatever you call it. Right, right. Did you ever meet Walt Disney or have any? No, you know, I met I met Roy Disney. Um, he had Roy Disney had this in Burbank. They have the Disney building there, and there's a little tower in the middle of it, which is like Mickey's hat from the Sorcerer's Apprentice. It's a sort of sorcerer's hat with blue with it's a blue hat with white with stars on it, and under that hat was a very small oval room, and that was Roy Disney's room. And um, no one else in the whole building was allowed to smoke. It was that kind of clean sort of place, except Roy Disney. He was allowed to smoke up in his his, his garret, of course, because he did own, own the joint. Um, I uh, so I'm, I'm I you know I, Walt wasn't around no at that point naturally, and I I never met him in my childhood. I would have loved to have done so. I, I followed his career all the way through. Right. So with I might jump in. Can I yeah. jump in for a second? I just wanted to make sure that everyone knows their books out on all sorts of these things. You just need to Google uh, Gerald's name and such, but the making of the wall, et cetera. There, 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 there's a great deal of this story that he's been talking about for those that want to delve deeper. You can find it easily online. So, so Jim and Gerald, I've got uh, with about nine or ten minutes left here, or longer if you like. I've got some no, of. The I think I think that'll do me. Okay, so I've got some. Jim, do you want to lead us through? I've got pictures here on page nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Would Would you like to talk about some of these, Jim? Or Gerald? Well, I think I think maybe, maybe yeah. it'll suffice. I mean, for example, you're looking now at the hammers marching with the gigantic judge uh, dwarfing a terrified pink. I mean, this painting uh, was one uh, that uh, painfully, I say, I never had in front of me because it was in a museum exhibition and it traveled throughout uh, at the Victoria and Albert uh, for the mortal remains uh exhibit of pink floyd that was one of the most attended of all exhibitions that um some seven feet across approximately uh a brilliant piece so uh, we uh, uh when we did that original exhibit i noticed the ones that you you uh, flip through there are uh, otherwise are paintings that we did have in our original exhibition in 2017 uh, this is the storyboard, some 50 storyboards of, you know, Roger and, and uh, Gerald uh, collaborating, uh, getting the idea, Roger's thoughts, ideas, his life, those things that were, they wanted to bring to life and express during the film. Um, uh, as I understand, Gerald, this was the final story uh, that uh, uh, set the tone and the story for the entire the movie so that's you correct see it, yeah uh, that's correct uh this this i did have this in our original uh, exhibition um the uh, uh let's see what's it i don't know if you want to say anything about that gerald the, the experience well, that sitting is, there, with... the, the, there were there were several the, you know the, the storyboard that i told you about earlier where, where i pinned pictures on the wall was one this was another one that i did pretty early on i suppose when the movie itself was supposed i when i was directing the movie by the way i didn't tell you that at the very beginning until it i could i just couldn't handle it i could not handle the animation and the live action so i must be the first and only guy who's turned down an mgm film i just said to i i just really couldn't handle it it was one step beyond me and also the cut and thrust of Hollywood and all that was, I, I, I wasn't sure I was up to fighting it. it, was where Alan Parker was. So Alan Parker, who was then producer, became director, and I became, you know, director of animation and so forth, and, so, and, and designer of the movie. Um, but this was an early version where I was um, 
directing it. And my concept would, would have been that it started in the theater itself in the, at a rock and roll, Pink Floyd rock and roll concert and developed from there. Um, so it, it would be figures on stage for, and then we would move into the outer world, you know, through animation, through all, through all sorts of other ways. So the one that, um, that Jim is talking about is unique because it's all one drawing. That is all one drawing. They're not squares stuck on. It's like a flow of my imagination of the film at that time. And it's, it's, it's that unique. And as uh, Jim said, it's been on tour and so forth. Um, and I'm, I'm still kind of clinging on to some of these, you know, I'm not letting them go yet um, because I want, I would like them really, a lot of these to go as a collection. And the collection, really, I have enough, I have a, enough work to make a museum correction of a co the complete devising and realizing of what became an iconic work of art. Um, I have it all. I have the notes, I have the scripts, I have the annotated scripts, I have the storyboards, I have the paintings, I have the drawings. It's a huge, huge collection of things. Uh, and as Jim knows, I'm reluctant uh, occasionally to let these things go because, um, but he's working on it. He's, he's, Jim is working on getting this thing out. Even today. As a museum <laughs> piece, as a mu museum piece, you know that would sell to somebody who would want to want have the whole work. Because once you start splitting it up, it's not that anymore. It's not a unique piece. Um, anyway, um, so this this piece here is one of, of, of many. And now, now the, um, you just flipped me on the teacher there, and there, that guy. That guy there on the top left is the teacher. And he was the one who used to, in Roger, Run in Roger's story, be sarcastic uh, to the kids in school, which we know teachers can be. They can really put you down because you're a young kid and they're a mate, uh, they're a, an adult, and they can they can be nasty. And so that was um, really my take on this teacher. And I realized very early on I wasn't going to be doing a realistic teacher. It had to be something which was kind of symbolic and would stick in the mind. Um, and I also had to conceive these very early on because these characters originally appeared on the album cover. And the album cover uh, was produced before the, the show and before the movie. So these concepts of the main characters were devised very early on and have more or less stayed the same. Um, I can't quite see the image there but i know that there were many images made inflatables made of this teacher there was one uh, on sunset boulevard i remember that um, had its arm around um, maybe that's it i don't know it had its round arm around a, a record shop tower records on sunset boulevard anyway had this gigantic teacher on it um, and um, so and then the in the concert itself, this character became an inflatable who would sort of walk around the stage and menace the kids, and it's um, we don't want no education. They sing the kids, you know. Um, so um, and, hey, teacher, leave them kid, leave them kids alone. <laughs> and this one is comfortably numb. Um, Roger and I both discovered that we had suffered from nightmares as a child, as children. And one of the aspects of those nightmares were that we felt that our hands were growing and enlarging into clumsy great lumps of meat. Um, and so this is my drawing of that. It's a kind of nightmare of the, 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 us, the people, with these gigantic balloon-like hands growing out of us. We have become. It was, com it was coincidental that you both had a similar dream, correct? Yes, it's extraordinary. It is, yeah. But maybe it's a common dream. I don't know. Uh, I haven't heard anybody else say that. But uh, both Roger and I said, "Yeah, I had that." You know. Um, now, education for what? This is probably my 
I, I, I forgot to mention that I was cartoonist, a political cartoonist on the Sunday Times in London, uh, which was the main Sunday newspaper for 50 years, 50 years, um, um, you know, I, I spent time, but it was like only once a week, Sundays. The rest of the week I did what I liked and did other work. But I did political cartoons there and um, they were about, you know, world politics and so forth. And um, but also this is one of my kind of political points, I suppose, which is um, education for what? No jobs. Now, it's, you know, about it's all these pink, little pink faces are educated and they go out into the world and there's no work. Um, so that, I guess, and I think, you know, maybe originally when I look back, I wondered, maybe Roger wanted me from my political uh, point of view, really. Although, as I told you, originally I was doing these kind of surreal images and um, not not political at all, although, you know, to a certain extent, they did become political later for him. But that was my main job in Britain. I would be known here as a political cartoonist, as well as, uh, you know, working in the theater. Right. Well, Gerald, you wanted to hold this to an hour. We're at an hour. Do you want, do you have anything that you'd like to, oh, we're going to page 56? What happened? What's that? Okay, I'm sorry. We're going to do polling question. Page 56 here, I apologize. Right. Would you like to learn more about Gerald? Would you yes. like to know about his paintings, his sculptures, his commissioned work, or all of the above? If you fill that in, then Jim may know what to, to make available to you. So Gerald, how does the commissioned work work with you? How does, you're actually available to do customized work? People uh, reach me, either through Jim or they reach me directly through my email and what they ask for is a um, well I'm doing oil paintings quite a lot now and ink pen ink and watercolor paintings can you still hear me absolutely we hear you fine I don't yep. know what happened to the video you, all right and um, the there are people uh, I mean at the moment I'm working on uh, something for a guy in Houston Texas and this guy goes to a bar that ha bears my name a scarf's bar in London and uh, this bar has my paintings on the wall uh, it sells booze it sells cocktails and so forth naturally like a bar and it's a very very high-end bar uh, it's owned by Rosewood hotels which are a huge huge organization which run all over America and into the Far East, Hong Kong, Beijing, uh, and in, in Europe as well. Um, and the, the guy who wanted this painting, he loves that bar in London. And he wanted a painting such as was in Scarf's bar. And so at the moment, I'm working on um, a painting with all a lot of his favorite characters in it. And they could be anything, you know, there's figures that are, he, he chose ACDC. He chose uh, Mick Jagger. He chose, you know, William and Kate, the princess, uh, and the, and the, the King Charles. He now is, and um, Harry and Meghan, and you know, and then there's Mrs. Thatcher and Winston Churchill, and a number of people. So he can re choose whoever he wants for me to draw. Um, it's expensive, naturally, but you know, he he um, he being a Houston Texan, I guess it's not going to worry him. Anyway, he's he's got so this this that's what I'm working on at the moment. I get a lot of uh, commissions for Pink Floyd stuff, you know, straight kind of things like you've been looking at the hammers and so forth. And Jim handles those, and I handle them, you know, directly through my website, whichever comes first. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. And um, the um, be, you know, and then you know, there's sort of high-end ones like the oil paintings, but there are more reasonable ones like the, the watercolor pen ink and watercolor. They're down the lower end of the, of the financial spectrum, but um, 
you know, I, I can't pretend they're inexpensive. They're not. Uh, you're not going to get anything for ten dollars. Okay. <laughs> that's, Gerald, not, that's not a very good sell, is it? <laughs> no. So, Gerald, Jim, any any final thoughts that you'd like to cover before we sign off? No, uh, I, I think that you you know you've got a good selection there, but I, as you say in my autobiography, there's a hell of a lot more to, the, to it. I could go on for another two hours, but I think I, I'm not sure my throat would stand it. I you know I'll start coughing after a while, and we'll we'll have to call an end to it. So let's just say you know it's been a pleasure, and especially to see Jim again physically. I mean, we're constantly in touch but I haven't seen him. Uh, and um, you're much improved, Jim, if I may say. So. I know this rather, sounds rather rude, to that, but there we are. You are the new slim, Jim, and although you were very nice before. And Alan, it's a pleasure to meet you, and uh, I wish you all success with your, you know, your enterprise here and so on. Yeah, and to all, the, to all the people who've been watching, uh, you know, I, I wish I could meet you all, but I, I don't think that's possible, even by um, modern standards. All right. So, well, thank you very much, Gerald. I'll be contacting you to put some of your art on my wall. And now for everybody who's been watching, we're going to, Gerald and Jim and I are going to sign off, but Brittany uh, has chosen some nice videos off of YouTube so you can see some of Gerald's amazing artwork. Uh, beginning now. Gerald, thank you again. Jim, thank you as always. I hope everybody has a fantastic rest of your day. Okay, goodbye, folks. Goodbye. See you. Bye. God bless.